Well, guys, I'm glad to be with you today, even though I am with you um, from a distance. This is distance learning. Anyway, today our class is about Mary and the Communion of Saints. This is an important part of Catholic apologetics because it is the thing in our church that is most misunderstood by our Protestant brothers and sisters. They think we worship Mary and we worship the saints. And you'll find out that we don't. And you'll find out, drawing this class, exactly what the church teaches about our relationship with Mary and all of the other saints in heaven. Before we get started, I'd like to address a question that was asked last time by someone in this class. That was a very good question. They asked, could a married and divorced man become a priest? For that matter, go on to become a bishop or even pope. And the answer was technically yes, but there's something else that would have to happen first. He would have to have an annulment of that previous marriage. An annulment is a declaration by the church, an official declaration that that previous marriage was null, null and void, and that that person was then freed from the vow that he made. Because what the church teaches is that marriage is a sacrament. And in that sacrament, there is a sacred vow. That vow is to the other person that we're marrying, but also to God. And so marriage is considered uh, an unbreakable lifelong vow. You can't just get a divorce and now we're no longer married. The church teaches that we're married until one of the two spouses dies. Uh, unless we get an annulment, and in an annulment, <clears throat> a metropolitan tribunal, that's a department in the diocese, like the Archdiocese of Atlanta, the metropolitan tri tribunal investigates the what happened at the time of the marriage back at the time of the marriage and determines if maybe there was a defect in the vows something wrong with the vow uh, maybe they were so young and not educated on what the church teaches about marriage and they didn't realize that they were making a lifelong vow to god uh, to stay married to that person and it was unbreakable Maybe they thought, uh, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll just get divorced and uh, start over again. Uh, the church teaches that you cannot do that. So if a married man got divorced and had an official annulment of his previous marriage, then in the eyes of the church, that marriage didn't exist. Sacramentally didn't exist. That valid, that vow was invalid and therefore the person is no longer um, responsible to um, live that married life until death and he could theoretically become a priest well now that we got that out of the way let's talk about mary and the communion of saints first let me give you the official definition of what we mean when we say the communion of saints. This comes from the Catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it is paragraph 946 as well as paragraph 947. It says this, the communion of saints is the spiritual union that exists between the saints in heaven, the souls in purgatory, and the faithful, that's us, the people living on earth. And this union between the three of them is one of grace and good works. And in recognition of this, the faithful, that's us, imitate, venerate, and pray for the intercession of Mary and the saints in heaven. We also pray for the souls that are in purgatory, the souls of the people in purgatory. So we imitate the saints because we know that they lived good lives and that they're in heaven. They did the right thing. They avoided evil. They did good, uh, and we want to be like them because we want the same reward that they got, right? Uh, we also venerate them 
And by venerate, we mean we honor them. We like just like we honor um, um, George Washington, and Abraham Lincoln, if you will. We honor Mary and the saints. And we pray to them. We do not worship them. We worship God alone. But we pray to them and ask them in our prayers for their intercession. Uh, intercession is that we simply ask them to pray for us. The same way that you might ask anyone to pray for you or to pray for somebody else. And uh, we also pray for the souls in purgatory people that are in the state of purgatory. They have died, but they didn't go to heaven, but they didn't go to hell either. They went to a place in between pur called purgatory. They weren't perfect. Uh, they needed to spend some time before they actually uh, go to heaven. So they're on their way to heaven, but they're detained in purgatory. So we pray for them that they would soon be released into the kingdom of heaven. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use scripture. I'm going to use the Bible to uh, explain how the church, teaching of the church about our relationship with Mary and the saints is the correct, correct teaching and our practice praying to the saints, asking for their intercession, that that's a correct practice. And I'm going to use the Bible to prove it. Okay. First of all, Every Christian is a member of the body of Christ. And Paul makes this clear in his letters, we call them epistles, to the different churches, like the church in Corinth, the church in Rome, the church in Galatia. Uh, I'm just going to share one of the three that I have on this slide with you. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And he says, as a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, the body of Christ. Whether we are Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we are all given to drink of the same spirit. We are all one body. So no matter who we are, no matter what race we are, what country we come from, what culture we come from, what color we are. Every baptized Christian is a member of the body of Christ. You become a member of the body of Christ when you are baptized. Okay? You become a member of the church. You become a member of the body of Christ. You become an heir to the kingdom of heaven on the day that you're baptized. And so, that's the first point. Every Christian is a member of the body of Christ. The next point is that the dead are very much alive in the eyes of God. When we die, we're not just gone. When we die, our, our soul, our spirit leaves our bodies, but we are still very much alive. Death doesn't really separate us from the body of Christ. We're still part of the body of Christ. We, the dead are alive in Christ. And here on this side, I give you three, three scripture um, verses that would, uh, would validate this belief, that the dead are very much alive. And I'm going to share one with you from the Gospel of Luke. In this, in this uh reading from the 20th chapter of Luke's gospel, Jesus is talking about those who have died, right? And he says that those who are dead can no longer die, for they are like angels. They are children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he is not the God of the dead. Instead, he is the God of the living. For to him, to him, all are alive, both those living on earth and those in heaven. So you see that the dead are very much alive in the eyes of God. Those who are in heaven um, are as alive as you and I are. 
and they can do even much more than we can. And there is only one body of Christ, not two, not one here on earth and one in heaven, two separate bodies of, the Christ, of Christ. There is only one body of Christ. And in Ephesians, Paul makes this very clear. I'm going to share from you for the, from the fourth chapter. He says, we are all part of one body and one spirit, as you were also called to the one hope of your call. That's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In other words, we are all one, right? There's only one body of Christ. It includes those living on earth right now, those in heaven, that's the saints, and also the souls that are temporarily in purgatory, right? And the church is the body of Christ. So you're still part of this church even after you die and you are either in purgatory or in heaven, hopefully. Right. Many of our Protestant brothers and sisters think that we worship Mary and the saints. They may say, see someone kneeling uh, in front of a statue of Our Lady or one of the other saints and claim there they are they're worshiping that statue they're worshiping that saint and that is against the first commandment first commandment says uh, i am the lord your god right there are no other gods and we only worship god himself no one else uh, so we don't worship mary and the saints uh, many times protestants will point to deuteronomy deuteronomy is one of the first five books of the Bible. And in Deuteronomy, which is a book of laws, right? God gives Moses a law against occultism. Occultism is, do you ever hear of a seance, a witch, uh, a medium that can speak to the dead and communicate uh, with people on earth, have them communicate with the dead? That kind of thing. Ouija boards, tarot cards, fortune tellers. These are what we're talking about when we say the occult. We call it occultism. Uh, so let me just read to you uh, what they're talking about from Deuteronomy 18th chapter. Let there not be found among you anyone who practices divination or is a, a soothslayer, sayer, <laughs> hard to say a sorcerer, sorcerer uh, or who casts spells or consults with ghosts and spirits or seeks oracles from the dead. Anyone who does such things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of such an abomination, the Lord your God will dispossess them before you. Okay, well, in our Catholic faith, we don't communicate with spirits. We have no secret knowledge and we get no secret knowledge from the dead. We don't do curses like witches do. We don't evoke satanic forces. We have no relationship at all with Satan or devils. We don't do seances. We don't practice pantheism. Remember pantheism? We talked about it before. That's when we ascribe to someone or something in creation an attribute that belongs to God alone, right? So we're not able to communicate with the dead. Now we do ask the saints, and they are dead in that they're no longer living on, on earth. We do ask them for their prayers, but we do not um, try to use them to give us a communication with our dead brothers and sisters, fathers, mothers, grandparents, or anything like that. Uh, that's different. These kind of attributes, being able to tell the future, all of those things, uh, they're attributes of God alone. We simply ask the saints to pray for us because God is the God of the living. And we ask them like we would ask anyone else to pray for us, okay? In the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel, <clears throat> describes what we call the transfiguration, how God, how Jesus took um, uh, Peter, James, and John up 
this mountain. And when they got to the top, he was transfigured in front of them. And he was, uh, they saw him talking to uh, Moses and Elijah. Now, Moses and Elijah are prophets from the Old Testament who are, you know, long dead. They are now saints in heaven. But Jesus was talking to them about what was going to happen and how he was going to suffer and die and rise from the dead and things like that. And, uh, uh, and the three apostles were, were able to, to see this, right? It was a vision that they were given. And uh, so there is communication among the saints and between us and the saints, but that is not at all the occultism that is described in the book of Deuteronomy and forbidden. When we talk to our Protestant brothers and sisters about Mary and the saints, they say, but the saints in heaven can't possibly see or hear us here on earth. Well, that comes from a very finite or a very limited understanding of uh, how it is to be a saint in heaven, right? Could the saints in heaven actually have the same limits that we do as human beings here on earth? Well, the answer is no. The saints in heaven have powers that we don't have, right? We know that when we die, we're not just gone, right? Our soul lives on, right? It remembers everything that we remembered on earth, and it can even see from heaven what's going on at earth, how their friends and their, uh, their relatives are doing and can intercede for them, right? My mother, my mother, my guardian angel, my mother had died long ago, but, but she intercedes for me and she can tell what's going on, right? Um, and God allows this to happen. I'm, I'm going to give you uh, several, these slides have several scripture references. We don't have time to go through them all, but I'm going to share with you from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. He's talking about uh, the difference between human beings and saints in heaven. And he says this, just as we bore the image of the earthly one, that's Adam from Adam and Eve, we shall, one where in heaven, bear the image of the heavenly one, that's Jesus, right? So uh, we are transformed when we die and go to heaven and we have powers. We are, we're in the transformed to the image of Christ. And we have, we become, uh, St. Peter says in one of his letters, we become partakers in the divine nature, right? We're given a gift from God and we can do and see things that we couldn't do while we were mere humans living on earth. So our, brother, our Protestant brothers and sisters say that Mary and the saints can't possibly see and hear us here on earth when they are in heaven. Well, scripture disagrees with that. And I'm going to just share with you from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book of the, God, of the Bible. And it was written by the Apostle John. Uh, and it was written around the year 90, uh, between the year 90 and 100 A.D. Okay, and he's talking about the souls in heaven and uh, he's given a vision. God gave him a vision of, of things that, that are to come. And he gave gave a vision of uh, the saint, some of the saints in heaven who had been killed by the Romans for their faith as Christians. And so he writes this in his vision. This is what he says. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because of the witness they bore to the word of God. They cried out in a loud voice, how long will it be, holy and true master, before you sit in judgment and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? So what did he mean there? Well, the, the saints in heaven uh, were watching what was going on on earth as the Romans continued to persecute the Christians back in the early church. If you were Christian and you didn't denounce your faith in Christ and worship the emperor, right, then it was off with your head, right? Or you were th thrown to the lions. 
uh, or even burned at the stake, okay? It was a terrible time, right? So these saints are watching what's going on on earth and crying out to God, well, how long will you let this continue uh, and not get back at those Romans for what they were doing here, okay? So they saw what was going on on earth. In Luke's gospel, Jesus tells a story. This is a, a parable, a story meant to teach a lesson. He, um, he told a parable about a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. The rich man died and he went, went to purgatory. And Lazarus, uh, the poor man, he went to heaven. And the, the man in purgatory, uh, the rich man, he cried out to God. He said, hey, send Lazarus. See, he saw what was going on. Send him to my brothers um, so that they'll convert and repent and that they won't have to go to purgatory. Um, send them, uh, send him, because they'll listen to somebody who comes back from the dead, right? Uh, he was involved. He even knew his brother's situation. He knew Lazarus, Lazarus, that Lazarus was in heaven. Uh, he was part of the communion of saints, right? Uh, in the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, Jesus said, there will be more rejoicing among the angels and saints in heaven over one sinner who repents than over a hundred who don't need repentance, okay? Well, that means those saints in heaven and the angels saw what was going on in earth. They knew that that one repented and they rejoiced, right? Um, in Matthew's gospel, just like in Luke's gospel that we mentioned before, Jesus says, at the resurrection of the dead, the saints in heaven will be like angels, okay? Uh, in Hebrews, Paul said, uh, the author of Hebrews says that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Those are the saints in heaven that are aware of what's going on on earth, right? As members of the body of Christ, uh, the saints in heaven are given the power by God himself. Sometimes our Protestant brothers and sisters will say, well, why waste your time? Even if you can speak to the saints in heaven, even if they are a part of the body of Christ, uh, even if they can see and know what's going on on earth, uh, even if they can pray for, uh, uh, for, for us, they can intercede for us, um, uh, why waste your time? I go directly to God. Well, Scripture teaches and I give you a bunch of examples on this slide. Scripture teaches that even though we, of course, can ask God directly for the things that we need, we can also ask people to pray for us, right? So we don't only asking ourselves, but we have others asking, right? Um, and so I'm going to share just a couple of these things from Scripture in, in the letter of James. Uh, in the fifth chapter, it says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. So what James is doing is he's telling the early Christians to pray for one another. And he's saying that the fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. Now, what's more powerful than a prayer of a saint? righteous person who is in heaven with a direct connection to God, okay? Uh, that's better than asking me to pray for you, for, uh, pray, asking me to pray for you, asking uh, one or more of the saints to pray for you, right? Uh, um, and also, uh, uh, Moses prayed for the people. He, he prayed, he interceded uh, uh, for the Israeli armies when they were battling the Melkites and others. Uh, uh, Mary at the wedding feast at Cana, they, uh, she was at a wedding celebration, like a wedding reception, and um, they ran out of wine. Uh, not good to run out of wine at a wedding reception. So she asked Jesus, she interceded, she asked Jesus to do something about it. And he said, oh, look, it isn't my time to start working miracles. No, but because his mother asked, he did it, right? Just like James says, the fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful, right? You might 
not have done it if you or I had asked. But when Mary asked, uh, then he right away turned water into wine. And sometimes our Protestant brothers and sisters will say, all right, okay, uh, I get all that, but you know what? Scripture says that there is one mediator between God and man, not multiple mediators, okay? And they get that from the uh, uh, first letter of Paul to Timothy. Timothy is one of his disciples, where he says that there is one mediator between God and man, and of course, that's Jesus. And Jesus is the unique link between God and man. If it wasn't for Jesus, no link would be possible. Man would be totally separated from God by sin. God and sin are incompatible. It is Jesus who brought us back together, right? Uh, but people have been mediators between God and man all along in all of this salvation history. We find it all over the scriptures, right? Uh, Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Moses interceded. He prayed to God for the people of Israel when they were starving and God sent them manna. When they were thirsty and God sent water from a rock. Uh, all of these kinds of things through, through, throughout history, uh, throughout salvation history, uh, it's countless times that people interceded uh, or prayed for others and God answered their prayers. Uh, and in, uh, in the, the uh, letter of Paul to Timothy, uh, he says this even at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, our brothers and brothers and sisters might have overlooked this. First of all, then I ask that supplications, prayers, and petitions and thanksgivings be offered for everyone, for kings and for all in authority, that we may lead quiet and uh, quiet lives in all devotion and dignity. He's asking for prayers. He's asking for people to intercede, to become mediators between God and man, right? Uh, this has gone on throughout of salvation history. Okay, now that we looked at the church's teaching on our relationship between, the relationship between us human beings Christians here on earth and uh, and the saints in heaven. Uh, let's let's look at what the church teaches about the Blessed Mother. What the church teaches about Mary. Okay, we're going to find a lot of witness about what the church the church teaches in the practices and teachings of the early church. This is the very very early church. The teachings that the apostles handed on to the next generation and maybe the next generation after that. What did the early church do? That's very important because that's, that's where uh, the truth can really be found because they, they didn't get it handed down over the generations. They got it directly from the mouth of the apostles themselves. Where did they get it from? They got it from Jesus himself. So let's look at what happened in the early church, what the early church taught about Mary. First of all, if we look in the Christian catacombs, the catacombs are tunnels that were built and dug out by Christians in the first centuries of the church when the church was persecuted. And you can, you can actually go down in these catacombs. I've been there. Uh, if you go to Rome, you can take tours of them. That's where the early Christians in the first, second, third century uh, that's where they would gather uh, and have mass. There's altars there and everything. Uh, they would bury their dead down there. They gathered to pray. They they gathered there on Sunday mornings, uh, <clears throat> and so that was their meeting place. All right, and in these ancient catacombs, we find frescoes that depict Mary as the mother of God, right? The mother of the and mother of the church and an interceder for us. Uh, and this mother of the church is a big thing. Mary's the mother of the church. Uh, we find her image in catacombs, images that indicate that the earliest Christians prayed for her intercession for, uh, for them and for those who have died. 
Here's one of those frescoes. It's a painting. And uh, you'll see here that uh, this is a casket. Uh, so, so here is, um, is a, a dead loved, loved one. Here's their body laid out in a casket. And uh, over that, you see painted uh, Mary with her arms extended in prayer. Uh, that at the time in the culture, that was a symbolism of someone who is praying, whose hands are like this. So they're right over this deceased person. And she is praying to God for that deceased person. And there is a, um, a person who's praying for Mary to intercede uh, for that deceased person, right? Uh, so the early church believed in the intercession of Mary for the dead. That is, comes alive when we study the art of the first century found in the catacombs. And here is a picture from a second century catacomb. Uh, and uh, it shows Mary praying again. And who is she praying for? The church. The church that is gathered around here. All right. She is seated, seated uh, at the right hand of her son in heaven, and she is uh, praying for the church. Her hands are extended in prayer. Of course, we, she is considered the mother of the church. So what does the church teach about uh, Mary? Uh, we would call that Marian doctrine. A doctrine is a teaching of the church. And the official uh, Marian doctrines are these. That Mary is the mother of God. She's rightly called the mother of God. And the church each also teaches in her perpetual virginity that she was a virgin uh, when Jesus was born and of, she was a virgin all of her life. She didn't have children after Jesus was born, other children. We also teach her immaculate conception, that she was conceived and born without the stain of original sin. And finally, the assumption that she was assumed, uh, her, her soul was assumed into heaven, as all of our souls are, uh, but also her body was assumed into heaven as well. That's why you will find no bones of Mary. We have the bones of Peter and Paul, the other apostles, and everybody, uh, but not Mary, because she, her body was assumed into heaven. She didn't rise from the dead herself like Jesus did. Only God could do that, but her body was assumed into heaven. So these are what we call Marian doctrines. Okay. So we Catholics are probably the only ones uh, among our uh, Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, Protestants never call Mary the mother of God. They just don't do that. But she is absolutely positively the mother of God. And you want to prove it to yourself? It's very easy. Just ask a few good, good questions like this. Is Jesus God? Yes. Was Jesus God when he was 12 years old? Yes. Was he God when he was two years old? Yes. Was he God when he was born? Yes. Was he God when he was consumed in the womb of Mary? Yes. Was he God when he was in his mother's womb before he was born? Yes. Was Mary his mother? Yes. Was Mary the mother of God? The answer has got to be yes. This uh, became a controversy in the early church. Uh, there were those, even in the early church, who didn't think that we should be calling Mary the mother of God as if, as if she existed before God. Well, no, she didn't. She is a creature like we are. But because of a special miracle, right, she became the mother of Jesus. And Jesus, excuse me, Jesus was God. And so... Uh, that, they use the word theokokos for that, Mary, the mother of God. It's a Greek word. And at the Council of Ephesus, that's in the year 431, when there was a controversy about this, should she be called the mother of God, the church made it absolutely clear by bringing all the bishops together in a, uh, an ecumenical council, right? just like um, Vatican, Vatican II was one of those in the 1960s. Uh, 
when the church has something that she has to make clearly clear. Uh, so it made clear at Ephesus in the year 431 that Mary is to be called the mother of God. Uh, in Luke's gospel, uh, you know that Mary, uh, after the Annunciation, after the angel told her that she was to become the mother of God, uh, that she visited her cousin Elizabeth. And when she visited her uh, cousin Elizabeth, how did Elizabeth greet her? She comes running out of the house and says, how does this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Well, when people said, my Lord, Adonai, uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in a Jewish language, uh, they, meant, uh, they meant my God. And so how does this happen to me that the mother of my God should come to me? You know, that was Elizabeth's greeting of Mary. All right. Just, uh, and just collaborating what we just said. Mary is indeed the mother of God. And uh, the art in the early church, this comes from another catacomb. Uh, it shows that Jesus here as uh, a, uh, an infant, and he has a halo on uh, showing, uh, showing uh, his, his divinity. And Mary, well, she's not divine, she's a saint, uh, but she also has the halo because she is the mother of God. She was depicted as the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, even in the art of the early church. And if you don't want to rely on the interpretation of art alone, then you can uh, uh, actually pay attention to the writings of the early church. This guy, Origen, is one of the early church fathers, right? One of the teachers in a very, very early church. Remember, the early church is important because the, they are the next generation that the apostles handed on the faith to, or the generation after that. Uh, and so they got it like right from the horse's mouth. And uh, Origen, one of the early church fathers, says, Mary was indeed the mother of God. She was the real and proper mother of the Son of God, whom the Gospels testify was born of her, right? So the early church is teaching the same thing. The church has taught this from the beginning, from the mouth of the apostles. So let's talk about one of the other teachings of the church on Mary. We church also teaches, besides the fact that she's the mother of God, that she, she we, the church teaches about her perpetual virginity, meaning that she was a virgin. She never had a conjugal relationship. Uh, she was a virgin when Jesus was born, and the church teaches she remained a virgin for the rest of her life. Uh, Jesus did not have brothers. Uh, and some of our Protestant brothers and sisters will point to uh, uh, the 13th chapter of Matthew, where it talks about the brethren, the brothers of the Lord, right? Uh, and even names some of them. It uses the Greek word, right? Adelphos, right? Now that word is found in many other places in the Gospels, and you can uh, see my other examples here on this slide. Uh, and it, it meant brother, but it meant brother in a wider term. They didn't have a separate word for brother and cousin. Adelphos simply meant a close relative, like a brother, would, it's true, but also like a cousin. Uh, and, and so the church has known from, from the beginning that Mary was a virgin for her entire life and that Jesus was the only one that she didn't, he didn't have brothers or sisters. In fact, uh, in John's gospel, in the 19th chapter, when Jesus was dying on the cross, one of the last things that he said to his mother was, woman, behold your son. And uh, he was talking about the apostle John, who was also there with her. They were the only ones. Um, and he said to John, brother, behold, man, behold your 
mother. Okay. So, in other words, what he's telling uh, John is to take his mother in to his house and take care of her for the rest of her life. He gave Mary to John for John to take care of. Uh, now, that would never happen in Jewish culture. If Jesus had brothers, if she had other sons, one of those other sons would be the one to take care of her. But no, uh, John got that job because there were no other sons. Jesus had no brothers. And that is also backed up by the teaching of the early church. Uh, the perpetual virginity of Mary was also affirmed by that same guy, Origen, that I talked about before, as a part of the original deposit of faith. The original deposit of faith, that's what we're talking about when we talk about early church stuff. This is the teaching and preaching of the apostles that was handed on orally to the next generation. Okay, He said, there is no child of Mary except Jesus, according to the opinion of those who think correctly about her. So here's what the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. Against this doctrine, the doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity, the objection is sometimes raised that the Bible mentions brothers and sisters of Jesus. And the Church has always understood these passages as not referring to other children of the Virgin Mary. Right? In fact, James and Joseph, who were named in the Bible as brothers of Jesus, Adolphus, are the sons of another Mary, a Mary who was a disciple of Christ and who Matthew calls simply the other Mary. Uh, and they are close relatives of Jesus, according to that Old Testament expression used in the Greek New, New Testament of office. Okay, don't panic. We're almost done. So let's just talk about a couple of more things. Uh, we have to talk about another Marian doctrine, which is Mary's Immaculate Conception. When we say Immaculate Conception, we are not referring to the conception of Jesus uh, in Mary's womb. We are talking about the conception of Mary in her mother's womb. Okay, uh, and uh, we'll talk about the assumption as well, that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven after she died. She didn't rise from the dead like Jesus did, but after she died a normal death, her body was assumed into heaven. Uh, okay, so around the year 320 AD, that's the early church, Ephraim, he was from Syria, he's another teacher in the early church, he was a brilliant teacher and a great poet, poet of the patristic age. This is what we call the patristic age, the age of the early church fathers. He described Mary as the most marvelous creature who exists after Jesus, of course, uh, and the source of the highest inspiration. He insisted on Mary's spiritual beauty and holiness, as well as her freedom from the stain of sin, including original sin. So. In the Immaculate Conception, we teach that Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin. The rest of us uh, do have the stain of original sin. It is removed only through baptism. Well, Mary uh, wasn't baptized in the, uh, uh, at, at, at certainly not at the time when she conceived, when she was conceived, all right, she was conceived with, uh, without that stain of original sin. Uh, this was a special grace and privilege granted to her for God, from God so that she would be a, an acceptable vehicle for his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Immaculate Conception that Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin is something that was taught and believed by the church from the beginning. It was necessary, so it was a necessary special grace of God. Uh, the life, death, and resurrection of, of her son hadn't happened yet. Uh, uh, he was, wasn't, wasn't even born yet, uh, but God applied what he knew would happen through, through Christ uh, to her 
ahead of time uh, and uh, actually preserved her from the stain of original sin uh, with which all the rest of us are born. And so this was done so that she would be a fitting vessel for God's son. Uh, this was declared uh, on December 8th, 1854 by Pope Pius IX. December 8th is the feast of the Immaculate Conception for that reason. And he said the most blessed Virgin Mary was in the first moment of her conception in her mother's womb and by the singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by the merits of her son Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, she was preserved immune from all stain of original sin. And so that's the that's this doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. The rest of us, though, are born with sin on our souls. Uh, sin that separates us from God. That's called original sin. We are born into a sinful world and we inherit the sins of our ancestors. And so uh, that sin separates us from God. At the time that we are baptized, uh, that stain of original sin is removed. Now, the relationship between us and God begins. The flow, the, your soul on that day was flooded with sanctifying grace. That sanctifying grace is the grace, the grace of relationship, the most precious and important thing in the universe. And that's our relationship with God through Christ, uh, made possible through the gift, the grace of the sacrament of baptism, right? Um, Mary didn't have to be baptized. <laughs> she didn't have original sin, but the rest of us have to be, and we should all be glad that we were, because now we have the most valuable thing in the world, uh, and that is a relationship with God through Christ and through the intercession of Mary and the saints, may we remain in the state of grace. That concludes our uh, class on Mary and the communion of saints. I hope it was helpful to you. Gave you a lot of good scriptures to back up the teachings of the church. Um, and uh, uh, next time, I guess next week, uh, we will do our final course in uh, Catholic apologetics. And it's my favorite one. Uh, it is about the teaching of the Catholic church on the sacrament of the Eucharist, because the Eucharist right? Holy Communion, the Mass, that's the center of everything. All Christian life revolves around that, and I'll tell you why the next time. See you then.